So hello. Um, I'll start by saying I'm seriously depressed now. Um, one, because I have to follow Renee, who's just an amazing speaker. Um, but also her choice of colors is horrible for me. So background is um, I was raised on military bases my whole life. My dad was career Air Force and ran the US Air Force. And for some of you who may know, they use two colors in Colorado uh, when they do war gaming, or they did during the height of the Soviet Union. And the US team was the blue team, and the Soviets were the red team. And I feel, unfortunately, like now I have to represent red strategy uh, for a little bit. And I worry that my father is going to completely roll in his grave on this one. So not sure how am I going to do it. Um, I will say, in defense of red strategy for a moment, a couple things. And then I'll try to highlight uh, some blue elements. But one is um, companies aren't very good at it. Um, I think it was a great thing to say everybody here knows the red side. But our experience is. Um, very often, companies don't even do basic competitive strategy. Um, two, I think the history of business is companies always give up on their core business too early. And I think the, the, the tension and the right tension for discussion in the room is the degree to when do you look at that next horizon, when do you look at the blue ocean versus what's left of growth in the core. And I think that's a classic business strategy. And the third thing is just from the red, ocean, the, the red side, representing the Soviet Union for a moment, uh, which I'm just reeling, I don't know. Um, I would say it's under huge revolution, and I'll try to bring that to life. I think first, in my uh, 20 years of doing nothing but strategy, I think strategy has changed from being very much about where to play to now an obsession with how to win. And that gets immediately into organization, frontline, and people. I think secondly, strategy, and I'll try to bring this to life, has largely been a left brain exercise. And I think increasingly it is left and right brain as you go forward. And the final thing is I think strategy, for all of you, the strategy planning processes still have huge legacies of perfect anticipation. What you're trying to do is collect a wonderful fact base that perfectly anticipates a world. You call that world base case. And you all know base case is the one thing that never occurs. And strategies move from anticipation to very much fast adaptation and how you do that. And so hopefully by the end, if I um, have any success at all, I don't know now, um, I will get at least a purple somewhere uh, as I try to describe things. But let me go. The, the thing I was asked to talk about was not strategy, because we had a fantastic presentation on strategy, but the impact on globalization on strategy and what is occurring with globalization. And so that's what I'll focus on. Um, I was asked to say, you know, try to put steps together of how you survive. So I came up with seven um, that I'll try to go through um, going forward. And I'll summarize it all at the beginning. Um, the first point is complexity is the silent killer of growth. And I'll go into this in some detail. And globalization is making the world a hell of a lot more complex. Companies, therefore, when we talk about survival, the companies that are winning, I'll try to describe seven steps of what they're trying to do. The first of which is they build off a strong core business. And they understand it, and they understand that core, and then defined a repeatable model for both international expansion and international defense. One of the great reasons to be at this conference is Tetra Pak remains, I think, the greatest repeatable model in business history, if you go into its history. And I'll try to bring that to life. Third is that they then apply that model in a disciplined fashion. And I think one of the, representing the Soviet Union, you know I'd say this now, one of the hardest things in business is maintaining discipline. As you go forward, says the communist, oh god. Um, finally, that you have an answer for the good enough segment. And I'll try to bring that to life and what that's doing in business. I personally believe that will probably unlock, unlock more innovation over the next decade than anything else, what's happening with this good enough segment going forward, which I think is very similar to this issue about not conceding any more cost on one hand versus differentiation. Focusing on global talent now, I'll leave it with you. The single best African strategy you can have is have 50% of your recruits from this point forward be Africans and not living in Africa. 10 years from now, you'll have a brilliant African strategy. Um, stay paranoid and endlessly paranoid, and I'll try to bring that to life. And finally, leverage partners, especially global, which would make this probably one of the most valuable meetings you're having this year, uh, if you think about going forward. So that, that's kind of it. If you need to go, if you're tired of this red strategy crap, please leave. Um, I will, in turn, struggle through the rest of this. Okay. 
So let's start with just complexity as a silent killer of growth. Renee referred to some data here, but let me try to bring it to life. As, as she said, total shareholder return is driven by both top and bottom line growth. And it's an interesting question of how many companies actually grow sustainably and profitably. And Bain has been looking at this since 78 over 10 year increments. And the data is pretty stunning, which is if you take the global 2000 and you look at it across reasonable data. The reason we use 5.5% real, just so you know, is because the entire global 2000, if you read their annual reports, are projecting to outgrow their industry by 2x. So the global 2000 is expecting to take share from the global 2000. But sustainable profitable growth, it means that 90% of companies are setting growth targets that they're announcing in their own annual reports that they will fail to achieve. Growth is an extraordinarily difficult thing in business as we've talked about, and only one in 10 companies achieve it. But the data is fascinating. Of those companies that don't achieve it, in only 15% of cases did they blame that on market opportunity, in hindsight. In all the remaining cases, they said it was internal issues and complexity. And that's why we start with this issue of complexity somehow as a silent killer growth. There's something happening in business. And if you think about it, what is business? Business was a CEO, a leader, a founder, working with the front line and a customer with very big clarity on what they sell and the lines were very clear. Something is happening in business that rather than automatically benefiting from economies of scale, we are often hurting from entropy and diseconomies of scale. I give whole presentations just on this topic, but just two examples of this. One is, as you all know, the next percent of growth for large organizations is a hell of a lot harder than when you were young. That's huge portfolio complexity. You get portfolio complexity, what do you do? You reorganize to management, manage it, boom, org complexity. You then say, SAP, someone save us, and you get process complexity. I gave this presentation in Atlanta about seven weeks ago to the CEO of AutoTrader, and then he added one. He said, and then what happens is you create dissonance. We spend all our time trying to align ourselves, and none of our time thinking about fundamental strategies we just talked about. The other thing that is going on is everybody is adding to the leadership agenda. Everybody is adding to it. I'll give one example just because everybody always talks about it. Customer experience. You all know you're now supposed to be ruthlessly focused on the customer experience, right? Everybody knows that now. Any of you who have gone through a customer experience exercise, this is looking at Apple, um, says what you do is you align what is the customer's experience with your organization and how do we get better at every aspect of it? We all kind of get that movie. Anybody who's gone through it, this is just looking at credit cards, knows that you're not organized against the customer experience. And so what happens is you are trying to deal with the complexity of your organization, the complexity of customer. It doesn't mean you don't do it. It just means as a simple phrase to add to your agenda, we should be focused on the customer experience, creates huge complexity. Credit cards, what they found is almost every measure they had for functional effectiveness was completely at odds with the customer experience and how do you manage that tension. Thank you.